Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks and praise for your glorious grace that you have lavished upon us in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. For indeed, you have chosen us before the creation of the world and brought us to your Son, all by grace. And you have given us the faith that we now possess to call upon Christ for salvation. Lord, indeed, uh, we thank you for bringing us to your Son, for saving us, Lord. Thank you for the blood of Christ shed for us and the hope that we have in him. And now we gather together as your people, the people of your pastor, the sheep of your hand. We pray that you would speak to us, give us ears to hear your voice, the voice of our good shepherd, and increase our own faith and confidence in your love for us. For indeed, nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Bless this word to us now, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, the passage we'll be looking at today is John chapter 10. In your pew Bibles, it's on page 1141. We'll be focusing mainly on the second part, uh, verses 25 to 30. And the sermon notes are in your bulletin if you wish to follow along there. John chapter 10, we'll be looking at verses 25 to 30 today. I've spoken a number of times uh, fairly recently to um, about the two dominant false teachings in our country today. We've been through this many times, and I'll be happy to go through it many more times because I think we need to be reminded of this. And they're greatly concerning to me because these false gospels are being preached in churches with steeples and crosses by pastors, some in robes, some in suits, some in skinny jeans, but they're being proclaimed. And they're calling this Christianity and they're invoking the name of Jesus, and they are frauds, and they're an abomination. And the two that I've referenced before, for those who haven't, aren't aware of them, is the first is the prosperity gospel, which is dominant in the Bible Belt down south, and uh, biggest churches in our country are oftentimes these churches. And you'll, they dominate the TV as well. And that is the teaching that it is always God's will that we prosper. It is always his will that we be healthy and wealthy and successful in this life, in this life. That indeed we can have our best life right now if we have enough faith, if we speak the words of faith and declare it, name it and claim it. It shall be ours if we have enough faith. And if you want to get more faith, you can always sow that seed of faith, by the way, which is giving money to the ministry calling you to such faith. That's the prosperity gospel. On the other side, there are the, is the progressive gospel, which is much more dominant in this part of the country. These are the churches with the rainbow flags. This is the place, the call to social justice, to political activism, and the belief that it is God's will that there be peace on this earth now, that there be equity and justice and peace and love and harmony now. And the way that we see this happen is that we need to get active. We need to do enough good works or even more preferable, organize as a community for politics and vote the right way get the right people in office and give power to the, just the right leaders and we can bring about God's kingdom here on earth. Now, I, am, I despise these gospels for a couple reasons. One is they are both claimed to be Christian, but they're Christless. There is no Savior Christ here delivering us from our sins raising us to glory, and they're used to promote their own self-centered agendas, whether it's for the leaders to get wealthy, because as the scriptures say, there are some who think that godliness is a means of financial gain, or to amass power to administer their own delusional self-centered agendas. But there's another very personal reason why I hate these gospels. If you, because they're not gospels. It's not good news. As Paul says, 
about the false gospels, but they're not, there's not a gospel at all there. It's not any good news. In fact, they are cruel teachings. I want to show you how cruel they can be because they take people like us, the sheep of Christ's pasture, and they're not content to simply steal the sheep from Christ, but then they insist on laying heavy burdens upon these sheep and putting them back in chains of oppression. So here's how it works. It isn't, isn't it bad enough that I, like many in our congregation, feel miserable and sick all the time? That I am struggling with health issues, chronic issues that are not getting better, only getting worse? Isn't it bad enough that I have to struggle financially and things just, life is hard? But then to have the smiling preacher tell me that I'm going through this because it's my lack of faith, because it's God's will, you know that you be healed, and you're not being healed because you don't have enough faith. That's why. And it's God's will that you be successful, and it's, you're not successful because you don't have enough faith. And so, can you imagine this, the burden says, as if it's not enough to go through these miseries now, I have to see this wealthy and healthy and smiling pastor tell me that I have no faith. And that God, my only conclusion is that God must hate me. That he must be continually disappointed with me. It's despairing. It is despairing. It's cruel. Or on the other side, it's, it's hard enough that I can't even get my own act together. My own household, my own kids to obey. I can't even bring peace to my house. And you're telling me? that I'm responsible for the lack of peace in the world, that all the issues like world hunger and poverty and sex trafficking and homelessness and pollution and racism, that even the hurricanes are somehow my fault. That burden. And we come to church to a place on a day of rest, and what do we hear? It's not good news. It's do more, do better. Give more. Believe harder. You're not doing enough. It's exhausting. Because I know I can never believe enough. I can never do enough. I can never give enough. That's why I think John 10's passage today, especially the second part of it, beginning in verse 27, is truly good news for us. That gives rest to the weary and the brokenhearted. Look it with me again at this passage. Verse 27. Jesus the shepherd speaks of his sheep. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now that is good news. And I want you to notice that the focus of these few verses is not on the sheep. It is not on the efforts of the sheep, their strength, their courage, their faith, their their weakness and their failing hands as Christ's sheep. The focus is on the hands of the shepherd. That's where it is, on the almighty and everlasting hands of the Father and the Son that hold the sheep. And that simple picture, this declaration, I would argue, changes everything. And so my hope is today is for us to especially those of us who might be feeling the weariness and the failures and the frustrations, to take a break for a moment from our labors and failures, to come to Christ. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is what? It's easy. My burden is light. Here is the easy and light burden of Christ. It's not even a burden. Is good news for us to take on. And it's a pondering here in this passage, I want to ponder with you the hands of God that hold us. 
So let's take a look at our passage again. We come back at verse 22. It's a review. We discussed this last week. The context of the passage is this feast of dedication, which we know today as the Feast of Hanukkah, which is a celebration of the great deliverance in 164 B.C. when the, the oppressed Jews, so severely persecuted and oppressed, beaten down, destroyed the temple, just abominated idols in the temple, pigs being sacrificed, it becomes capital punishment to do anything related to the Jewish faith and how God raised up for them a family, in particular one man, Judah the Maccabee, who would lead them to victory, lead them to actually take back Jerusalem, to rededicate the temple, to bring a level of freedom they had not known in hundreds of years. What a wonderful thing. And that great act of this wonderful deliverance reinforced their expectations of what the Christ would be when he does come. The promised Christ, the son of David, the promised one who would deliver them, how he would do it. And the assumption was, and everyone thought this, everyone thought, not just the Jews, even the, in the heavenly realms, it was a secret plan not revealed to anyone before. The expectation was the Christ would come and he would come as a conquering king, not as a shepherd who lays down his life, but as a king who lays down the life of his enemies. That's how he's supposed to come. And he would be the deliverer of Israel, deliver those sheep. He would not care about the other sheep. There are no other sheep out there. There are just dogs out there of the other nations. And so he says, no, this is, their expectations were so frustrated. They ask him, tell us, are you the Christ? They don't believe, and he tells them, why they don't believe, and why is it that they can't receive him as the Christ? It's not because they're stupid. It is because of this, he says. They ask him if you're the Christ, and in verse 25, he answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe, because you are not among my sheep. That's why. His sheep believe. That's what John tells us in John 1, 1, 1, 11. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. They were not his sheep. But his sheep did receive him and believed in him. And they are the sheep of his hand. So let's look now at the hand of the Son of God and what this hand performs. First, the hand of the Son works the Father's wonders. He works the Father's wonders. He tells them here. Verse 25, answer them, I told you, you don't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you don't believe. But even so, his hand does one with his hand works the Father's wonders, and those works and wonders reveal his Father's glory to us. They are not the works of a conquering warrior dictator. They are the works of a father full of grace and truth, full of love. And just consider the last work we saw that Jesus did with his hand. If you remember back in chapter 8, that wonderful miracle where Jesus, the Son of God, with his hand takes some dirt and spits in it, and with that same hand makes mud, and with that same hand anoints the eyes of a man who was born blind, had never seen anything before. And that gives him sight as he goes and washes off the mud he can now see. That hand that did not come to blind his enemies and destroy them, that did not come to condemn and kill those born into sin like this man, but to open their eyes, to show them the truth, the love of God in Christ. So that's the first. The work of his hands glorifies the Father. This is all revealing the Father's plan. But second, this is the hand, as we see here, that saves his sheep. He says with that hand, Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. 
So let's ponder a little bit of the rest of chapter 10. He has told us what that hand does. The hand of the good shepherd is, again, not the hand of the warrior that kills. It's not the hand of the judge that slams the gavel and pronounces us guilty. It's not the hand of the executioner. It is the hand of the shepherd, strong and kind. It's the hand that first leads his sheep in and out of his sheepfold. That's what he told us. Earlier in the passage, he says, I am the gate in verse 7. I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me, they're thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes to steal and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. This is the hand that leads his sheep in and out. And by that we mean this. Just picture it here. The, the, there's the sheepfold. And out in the fields, in the wilderness, are the lost sheep who've escaped, who've rebelled, who've gone their own way and are in grave danger. And the shepherd goes and with his hand brings home each of his lost sheep. He brings them in to the sheepfold, rescuing them from the dangers, the damnation, the death that is surely coming to them, which they deserve for their straying. And he brings them, calls them by names, and even carries them home, and he brings them in. And then once he gathers them in, he then leads them out to find pasture. He leads them out. He doesn't just bring them in and abandon them. He brings them in, and then he leads them to the still waters, to the green pastures. He leads them through the valley of the shadow of death. He leads them to the banqueting table of his father in his own home. He leads them out as well, the abundant eternal life that he promises each one of his sheep. For the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep is the good shepherd who took up his life, was raised, and he ascended to heaven, and he lives forever to intercede for his sheep. So that what does he say? No one can snatch us out of his hand. He does not let us go. This is not a relay race where he comes to us with the baton, hands it to us and says, you take it from here. Not a good idea. He holds us and no one can snatch us out of his hand. And this is also the hand that we learned in other passages that brings his sheep together. This was the offense of what he's telling the Jews here. Is this? He says, I have sheep. In verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there'll be one flock and one shepherd. This is the hand that brings his sheep together. He goes to the furthest ends of the world, to places where you didn't even know there were sheep hiding there, in the rocks and caves and crevices and the most horrible places, and he grabs each one of them one by one. He brings them home. That's just a shock to the Jews. Wait a minute, I thought the Lord is the shepherd of the Jews. You mean he's the shepherd of the Romans too? That the people that hate us and we hate he came to save them as well? Indeed. And he intends to bring them all together, to bring us all together as one flock and one shepherd. Remember that. I, I keep stressing this. We've forgotten this over COVID, that Christ's plan is not to have billions of sheep hiding in their own homes that he relates to one-on-one -on -one with that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. His plan is to bring his sheep together. This is what it looks like. A gathering of a flock, we gather together around our shepherd. That's how it is to be. He doesn't say, I'm the good shepherd, I have a billion sheep, and I know them all personally. He says, I have one, and bring them all together so that there will be one flock and one shepherd. And that's why the scriptures command us, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit. Don't wander away, stay together, get together, get out of bed, come, gather with your people. This is where we belong. And ultimately, he tells us in our passage here, that hand that has led us into the fold and given us salvation, that hand that has brought us together, he tells us that hand in chapter 10 again, 
Verse 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one can snatch them out of my hand. That is the hand that gives his sheep eternal life. He holds his sheep in his powerful hand and then raises them to eternal life. And no one can snap the sheep out of his hand. John hits this theme quite a few times in this gospel. Remember John chapter 6? All that the Father has given me will come to me, and I will not lose one of them, but I will raise them up on the last day. He will not lose a single one of his sheep. And we see that in that story of the blind man. If you remember that story with the blind beggar, after he's healed, the Pharisees, these thieves and robbers, are doing everything in their power to keep him from giving glory to Christ and following Jesus as his Lord and Savior. They're doing everything in their power. They are threatening him. They're threatening his family, for goodness sake. They're putting him on trial, and in the end, they kick him out, and they argue with him, and he stands his ground and even puts them to shame, humiliates them, actually. It's a remarkable scene, and he will not budge. He will not budge. I'm like, why? Why? Is it because this man was just a remarkable character and strength and courage? Was he just this incredible hero? Like he's a blind beggar. He's not very smart. He's certainly not strong. There's no way he could stand against Pharisees like that. No, there's only one reason. He's one of Christ's sheep. And no one can snatch them out of Christ's hand. He holds him. That's why. That's why. That's the only reason. They're just, here's another picture for you. I want you to picture, if you will, a, a, a little lamb that's gotten lost and astray. And he's just bruised, broken his leg. He's out in the field, out in the wilderness, and he can see in the night all the eyes of the wolves waiting on him. The terror in him. The fear and the horror of what's about to happen. But now, same scene, everything's the same except one thing. The shepherd has entered the circle and has taken that lamb, still broken, in his arm with one hand and his staff in the other, or if it were today, machine gun in the other. And now, that little sheep that was in horror just a second ago is feeling pretty good and even begins to taunt the wolves out there. Yeah. No chance. All because of one thing, not because his strength, he's still the coward sheep he was before. He's in the arms of the shepherd, he's in the hand of the shepherd. And no one can snatch them out of the son's hands. Well, now Jesus does something beyond belief here in the next verse, next two verses. These two verses are about to get him stoned. They'll try to stone him if they could. But it speaks of the, of the Father. That Christ, the Son, is not the only one in this picture here. He now goes to the deep mysteries and speaks about the Father's hand. And look at that with me here, 29. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. He now speaks of the hand of the Father. And we know, as we look at the gospel and we look at the letters, that the hand of the Father is the hand that certainly exalts his Son. And he tells us a couple things about the hand of the Father. One thing here, and then I will mention another one from Ephesians chapter 1. The hand of the Father, first of all, is the hand that exalts the Son, the hand that is, he says, greater than all. The Father who has given them to me is greater than all. The Father and the Son indeed are one, but they are not the same. They share a unity in their glory, in their divinity, in their love and purpose. But the Father is greater than all. And if you remember, Jesus says that. As the Son, I can do nothing apart from my Father. He lives in complete dependence. The Son is almighty, but all of his power is from the Father through him. They are one, like hand and glove here. 
but the Father is greater than all. He is the source, which is why, by the way, when we pray, we pray to the Father. He is the giver of all things. He is the greater, the greater than all. And he's the hand of the Almighty, and he does whatever he pleases, and no one can stop him. You know, one of my favorite psalms that has given me such hope and encouragement, I, I repeat this so many times to myself, is Psalm 2, because you look at the world and you're like, oh, evil abounds, and the conspiracies, and you're realizing that all those conspiracies that you kind of laughed at before, I'm getting a sense they might be true. This is crazy things that are happening, the powers in the world, and, and not just the conspiracies of, the, of the, the nations, but the conspiracies of the evil powers. And it says in Psalm 2, why do, the na- why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain, conspiring against the Lord and against his anointed? Why do they do that? And he says, the Lord in heaven laughs and he holds them in derision. Just imagine this, if all, all of creation, all the nations and armies, all the kings, all the weapons, even if all the animals joined in, and add to that all the heavenly host, all the demonic powers, and even if they joined forces with all the the good angels and the good powers as well, if every last part of creation came together in a perfect unity, and purpose, they could not even budge the little finger of the Father. He would laugh. That is the Father. And that's why he says, not only do I hold them, but the Father does too, and no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. And the Father's plan with this almighty hand is to put all things under Christ. If you want to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, it's on page 1241. You want to know what the Father's plan is, he tells us. 1241, Ephesians chapter 1, it says this in verse 9, he made known to us the mystery of his will, the Father's will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Christ, in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. His plan is, with that almighty hand, is to put all things together under Christ. All things, that all nations, all authority in heaven and earth will be given to His Son. His plan is to exalt His Son. That's what His plan is. To give Him the highest place, to raise Him to His own right hand, so that all creatures in heaven and on earth and under the earth will say, Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the plan. That's what the Father's hand does. And now also we see in Ephesians 1 that that hand also concerns us. He has a plan. And the plan for us is this is the hand that adopts his children, the God's plan is to exalt his son above all things, to give all creation to his son, and also to give him the greatest gift the father can give his son, which is a family, to enjoy it with him forever. The son, who is the only begotten son, longs for a family, for true sons and daughters that he can call his own. And the Father says, I will give that to you. I will adopt a family for you. And that's what he says. Remember, that's what John 1.12 said. Those who did receive him, he gave the right to be called children of God. That's really what our salvation is about. It's not about simply getting to go to heaven and enjoy paradise and unlimited rounds of golf. That's not what heaven is about. Heaven is the eternal throne, our eternal home. It's a place where we know God truly as our Father, and to come home to Him. We're family. And how do we become His family? Well, He tells us what His hand does. Chapter 1 of Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him, 
In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to his purpose and will. This is the hand of the Almighty that chose his children out of fallen humanity before creation. He chose us in him before creation. Ponder that for a moment. Our salvation began not the moment when we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It began before God even said, let there be light. He chose us in him. Before, out of all the creatures, he chose us to be adopted into his family through Jesus Christ. And those who he adopted, we're told, these are the ones that he has given to his son. Sorry to bounce you around again, but come back to John 10, 1141. Jesus says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. That's what he said in John 6. All the father has given me will come to me. He chose his children before creation and he gave them to his son. All that the father has given me will come to me. And there is no loss in this transfer because no one can snatch them out of the father's hand. And so indeed, we, this is how it works with evangelism too. We proclaim the good news to all the nations because there are children out there. There are people out there the Lord is intending to adopt and bring to his son and they just need to hear the voice of the shepherd calling them. And we call out, Christ died for your sins. Christ rose again for your salvation. Repent, believe in him, look to him, come to him. And when that word goes forth, his sheep hear his voice. Those who are his children come to Christ. Those whom the Father has given to the Son come to him. The Jews that are speaking to Jesus in this passage, he says, they don't believe. And the reason is, they're not his sheep. But we who have believed, we are here not because we chose him, but he chose us. He called us. That's, that is an awesome thought. That's what we mean by grace. We're saved by grace. Again, the adoption picture. The orphan doesn't search the world to find the worthy parents. It's the parents who come after, even go to faraway countries to bring that child home who could never come home another way. So it is with the Father. He chose us in creation, before creation. He gave us to his Son, and then in his hand, he holds this family together forever. He holds the family forever. Again, no one can snatch them out of my hand. That's what we read in Romans 8. We need to read this again and again. And we know that God works all things together for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those whom God foreknew, who knew before he even created them, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, to be just like Jesus, be like his son. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified, forgave us our sins, declared us righteous. And those whom he has justified, he will glorify. What shall we say to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? Does that sound like good news to you? I want to uh, put this together now. I'll call this the blessed assurance of being in the hands of God. The Father and the Son in perfect glory, power, and love. And then there is us, this mass of fallen humanity, full of sin and shame, condemned and dying like sticks in a fire. And the Father in his almighty hand grabs sinners by name. He knows everyone from every nation, every language and tribe, and he brings them to his Son. And in that exchange, the Son takes every last one the Father has brought to him, dies for their sins, rises again for their justification, secures their salvation forever and ever, leads them by every path, is never leaves them, never leaves them, and no one can snatch them out of the Son's hand. And the Father, meanwhile, never lets go either, because he and the Son are one. 
what the Son holds, the Father holds too. And he brings them to eternal life and joy in the Father's house. That does change everything for me. And I want to just share a, a little bit of a personal story. It's, not, it's sort of a realization. I've shared this before, and so bear with me if you've heard it, but my understanding of salvation, because I was raised in the church. I knew the Lord at an early age. I thank God I had faithful parents and people who loved me and shared the truth with me and prayed for me. But my understanding of salvation was this. We are like on the Titanic, which has sunk, and we're all just floating in the water, trying to stay aboard, and we are perishing. We're doomed. We are doomed in the icy waters, and crying out for a Savior, and lo and behold, here comes Jesus in a boat, and he reaches out his hand to me, and he says, hold on. I'll bring you to safety. And I thank you, Lord, and I hold on. And he's pulling me up. And he keeps telling me, hold on. Don't let go. Hold on. And my hands are slipping because I've been in the water for a time now. I'm a little bit weak. And they're slipping. Don't let go. Hold on. Keep holding on. Don't let go. And I'm slipping. I'm slipping. And I'm in terror and fear because I know at any moment I could fall back again. And the horrors of this. And I'm just hoping somehow I can... Get over the edge of the boat. And sometimes you feel that way. Kill me now before I fall away. Just take me now. And you can feel that weakness and your frailties. And hold on, hold on, don't let go. And the horrors of that. Even though I'm in the process of being saved, I'm like, there's no assurance at all. But then I come to John 10. I come to a book of Ephesians and I see a different picture. I don't see that picture there. I see passages that say that we were dead in our transgressions and sins. Hmm. Not drowning at the top of the water, but bloated at the bottom of the sea. Fish nibbling at us already. We were dead. And the Son of God comes down not with a boat, But maybe even with a, doesn't need a diving suit, but he reaches his big hand down there to the bottom, grabs hold of me, gives me life, raises me up with him, and I am in his hands. And he says, no one can snatch you out of my hands. You can't even slip. There's nothing for you to hold. You can't even wiggle out of my hands. You think I'm going to let you drop? You think that I who came and gave my life for you and was tortured and cruelly beaten and bore the wrath of God for you, do you think I'm going to let you go? No. Absolutely not. And the fear is gone now, especially as I begin to feel his hands around me and I begin to trust those hands. That's what faith is. Faith is not me holding on to him. Faith is me trusting his hand to hold me. And he raises me up, and a wonderful thing happens because the fear is gone now. I'm like, wow. You can almost enjoy the ride. But then I also notice that my hands are free, and they're not doing anything now. Hmm. I could use these hands now. I could maybe use these hands to serve and to love and to give and to do all those things that used to burden me now are a joy to me as I am set free. That's, this changes everything. My personal salvation and the salvation of this whole world and God's plan is not up to me, nor is it up to you, It's not up to our sufficient faith or works that we have to do more, do better, give more, believe more, speak more, whatever it is. But faith now is not trusting in myself at all, but trusting in Christ alone. And the knowledge that he will hold me fast. He will not let me go. I can rest. I can trust. And I can even love. 
for the first time. That changes everything. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the good news of your grace, amazing grace to us. That while we were still sinners, while we were dead in our sin, Christ Jesus came and died for us, came into this world, not to condemn us, but to save us. Thank you, Lord, for this good news. Thank you that you are our good shepherd, not just our savior, but our shepherd who never leaves us nor forsakes us, but holds us fast, even to the end of the days. Lord, increase our faith even now. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.